Well, this evening, as I mentioned this morning, we're going to be looking at that section we didn't look at this morning in uh, Matthew chapter 7. Uh, it's verses 7, 7 through 11. And uh, we do need to understand that Jesus didn't just kind of wedge that in there in order to bring up a new topic that's not related to what he was talking about because it is sandwiched uh, between two sections that really deal with treating people uh, the way that, that we want to be treated. And I believe here that Jesus is telling us where we're going to find the power to be able to do that. But we do want to apply it more broadly than that because certainly our Lord does that. So let's, let's take a look at what he has to say first, and then we'll, um, we'll get into this. Now Jesus says beginning in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father, who is in heaven, give what is good to those who ask him? Well, may the Lord help us to understand what Jesus is saying, would he, would he help us to, to receive it, and particularly to apply it. Now remember this morning Jesus told us that we are not to judge others in the sense that we are not to have a critical spirit uh, towards others. Uh, we do need to evaluate what people do by the scriptures and we do need to draw conclusions about their actions, whether they're good or bad, so that we can reach out to them in mercy to evangelize them if they're not converted. And again, that's um, uh, an evaluation we have to make, whether they need to be evangelized, or if they are believers, to correct them. But what Jesus was telling us was that we are not to use what we determine to criticize or co to condemn them, uh, to use it as a weapon, basically, against them. And the difference between those two things is essentially one of motive, uh, the Lord doesn't want us to seek revenge, but he wants us to be merciful. Now again, remembering that our Lord has told us that he is going to treat us in the way that we treat others, uh, we need to remember that if we are not willing to show mercy, uh, he is not going to show us mercy. We will be treated by God and by others in the same way that we treat them. So we want to show mercy mercy because that's also what we hope to receive. Now Jesus also told us that if we are to do this effectively, we do need first of all to deal with our own sins, taking the log out of our own eye so that we can see clearly to take the speck out of our neighbor's eye. Uh, we also know that we need to follow Jesus' example in this. Remember, he told us we are to treat others the way that we want to be treated. Jesus was the one who did that perfectly we need to follow his example, how he approached others. Remember, Jesus, above everyone else, loved his neighbor perfectly. He loved us perfectly, and we are to love others as he has loved us. Let me just remind us that Jesus is not telling us to do something that he hasn't already given us the power to do by his Holy Spirit. That's why he gives us the Spirit, so that we can uh, be like him. Now this evening, let's consider one final thing that Jesus commands us to do that will help us to deal with our sins and to approach others with a humble heart so that we can serve them rather than uh, injure them, and that is pray. So what we want to do is look at three things uh, this evening. We want to look at the fact that Jesus commands us to pray. These are commands, they're, they're not really suggestions, they're not offers, um, they're commands to pray, and really they're commands to pray continuously, um, bombarding heaven until the Lord answers. Uh, secondly, that he promises that if we will do this, he will give us what we ask. That, that's one thing that we really need to wrap our minds around, that we need to believe God answers prayer 
And even though I wasn't planning on using this as an example this evening, just remember George Mueller. Remember, he prayed, he believed. The Lord answered his prayers every single time. And then thirdly, we want to look at the, the encouragement Jesus gives us. Again, another one of those arguments from the lesser to the greater, that if we being evil would give to our children what it is that they ask of us, how much more will our Heavenly Father give what is good to those who ask Him? So first of all, let's consider that Jesus commands us to pray. He says in verse 7, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be open to you. you know, if we look at what each of these words actually are, ask, seek, and knock, uh, they're, they're really commands. They're, they're given uh, in the imperative. And really, they are all of them commands to pray. Now, Jesus, first of all, tells us that we need to ask. And, of course, we know who it is that we are to ask. We are to ask our Heavenly Father because Jesus tells us in the last verse of this particular paragraph, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask Him? Obviously, we are to ask the Father. That's what Jesus is really commanding us to do. Now, we should step back just for a moment and realize what a privilege it is to be able to do this. I mean, we want Jesus to actually give us this kind of command because the command implies that the Heavenly Father is our Father and that he, he, we have the right, really, to come to Him and ask for these things. You know, since we have come to the Lord Jesus Christ and we have received Him by faith, we've been adopted into the family of God. And as his children may call him our father, and Jesus says may ask him for what we need, and we have the promise that he will provide it. So this is a tremendous privilege, even though it is a command, and really everyone should want to have this command issued to them. Now Jesus tells us also what it is we should be asking for, and this is uh, what I said is implied by the context of, uh, in which he says this. He, he's really telling us that, first of all, we should ask for strength. Strength to do what we were just reminded he told us to do this morning. Strength not to be critical of other people when we see their faults, when we see their sins. But to be able to deal with their sins in the right way. To be able to deal with our sins the way we should so that we can reach out to them in mercy as our Lord reached out to us. But again, as I said before, we don't want to limit this, this command or this promise only to that area. We certainly want to apply it to that area because I think that's why Jesus said it. But we should also apply this to everything else that we actually need. Now that we are God's children, we can ask for whatever we need and know that he's going to provide it. Jesus said to his disciples when he was preparing them, when he was helping them get ready for the time that he would be taken away from them during his crucifixion, and then the time that, that he would see them again, uh, he encouraged them by what the crucifixion and the completion of his work would actually mean for them. We read in John 16, verses 22 through 24, Again, speaking of his crucifixion, therefore, you too have grief now. Because he, he told them in John 16, the upper room discourse, that he's going to lay down his life. But I will see you again, and your heart will rejoice. And no one will take your joy away from you. In that day, you will not question me about anything. Truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Until now, you have asked for nothing in my name. Ask, and you will receive, so that your joy may be full. Notice Jesus says, we can ask him for anything in his name, and he will give it to us. Uh, <coughs> Jesus also says, excuse me, <clears throat> in John 15, verse 16, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you 
that you would go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give to you. So again, Jesus is telling us not only that we may ask for the power to be able to do what he's called us to do, but we can actually ask him for anything that we need. As a matter of fact, he tells us that that's what he wants us to do, to ask. When we receive things, again, God is the one who is giving them to us, but it gives him much more glory when we look to him and realize that he's the giver, ask him for those things so that when we receive them, we give him the glory and not just think that this is sort of the way things go in life. It's always been this way. When I do these things, I get these things. We need to remember that they all come from God. Now, Jesus strengthens the fact that he wants us to ask for all these things even further by telling us not only that we should ask, but also that we should seek. And I think when he says this, he doesn't mean so much that once we have prayed for something, that we should watch for the answer to that prayer, you know, uh, to seek for the answer to that prayer, though certainly we should watch, you know, we should pray and watch, no, knowing that God's going to answer. Nor does he mean that once we pray that we should seek to do what, you know, we need to do in order for that to be fulfilled because oftentimes, you know, we're praying and asking the Lord uh, for certain things uh, that we should be involved in. For instance, if we ask the Lord to save our family members and our friends or if we, we ask the Lord to bring people uh, to the church, uh, we shouldn't expect them uh, to be saved simply because we prayed unless we actually go and share the gospel with them. In other words, you know, once we've prayed, we need to seek that that prayer be answered through our participation in, in doing what it is we're asking the Lord to do. He doesn't save apart from the gospel, and so we know they need to hear it, so we should go and tell it to them at the, at the same time praying that the Lord would make that gospel effective to save them. If we want people to, to come to the services, of course, we, we, we pray. Sometimes when we pray, the Lord does just bring people out of the blue. He moves on their hearts and brings them. But really, we shouldn't expect them to come unless we actually invite them to come. So we need to seek that they might come as we pray. And certainly, when we ask the Lord to supply our needs, we shouldn't expect Him simply to drop things out of heaven in order to meet those needs, but rather we should do the work that is necessary, asking that God would bless that work and make it fruitful so that our needs would be met. Now, all those things are true, and we should do those things, seek that the Lord would answer those prayers and that we would do our part. But I think what Jesus actually means here is that when we ask that we should seek God, continue to seek Him, seek His face of blessing. That's one of the terms that's used in, in Scripture for prayer, to seek the Lord, seek His face continually until He answers our prayers. And then I think Jesus strengthens this command even a little bit further by telling us that we should also knock. Now, again, I don't think Jesus is speaking so much here about how we determine His will for our lives. You know, it's been said that, um, you know, you want to find out which way God wants you to go, and you've got several ways to go in front of you, several doors of opportunity, and so you go up to each door and you knock, and you knock, and if the Lord opens the door, well, that's the door you're supposed to go through, and, and certainly the Lord does that. You know, He does open doors of opportunity and shows us what He wants us to do, but I don't think that's what Jesus means here. I think what He's saying is that with our asking and seeking the face of God, we need to continue to knock, as it were, on the door of heaven until the Father opens that door with gracious answers to our prayers. Ask, seek, and knock. And you know, Jesus puts this in still, in still a further, uh, I should say, a stronger way by the particular tenses that he's using here in these commands. You know, there's different types of commands in Scripture uh, that are reflected by these different tenses. Sometimes the command is, is to start doing this and continue to do this or do this one time or something to that effect. But here Jesus is telling us, I want you continually to do these things. We are not to ask for what we need just once or seek Him just once 
or knock just once at, at his door. But we are to ask and keep on asking. We are to seek and keep on seeking. We are to knock and to keep on knocking. And I think what Jesus has in mind here is this, that we can't seek the Lord half-heartedly uh, for the things we need, the things for his kingdom and the things for ourselves personally, and expect to be heard if we're not willing to put any more effort into it than just simply the, the one-time effort. If we're not seriously seeking the Lord for these things by our continually coming and asking, the Lord really isn't going to take us seriously either, and he's not going to answer our prayers. Persistence is important. And persistence is, is really at least one of the things Jesus was teaching his disciples in this particular parable of the widow and the unjust judge. And he uses an argument kind of similar to the one that uh, he uses in this latter part of our text, this last part. But we read in Luke 18, verses 1 through 8, and notice the reason why Jesus gives it at the, at the front. Now he was telling them a parable to show them that at all times they ought to pray and not to lose heart, saying, in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while he was unwilling, but afterward he said to himself, even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise, by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now, will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. If the wicked unjust judge will answer the request of this widow because her coming bothers him, how much more will the Lord, who is the God of justice, answer the prayers of his own people? So again, the idea of persistence in our prayers, asking, seeking, and knocking until we see the answers to these prayers. Now secondly, what will the Father do when we pray as Jesus tells us? Well, again, here's one of the greatest promises we have in the Bible. What we are asking for, he says, will be given. What we are seeking after, we will find. The door will be opened to us. So in other words, we will see God's face of blessing. He will open the doors of heaven. He will give us what we're asking. He says in verses 7 and 8, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, it will be opened. Jesus guarantees that we will have what we ask. And really, this guarantee is just as valid for us today as it was for the disciples when Jesus first spoke it. Now, the reason why Jesus will do this, or why the Father will do this for us, uh, are at least three. Uh, first of all, because we will ask, because we have the Spirit of God, for what the Father actually already wants to give us. Uh, listen to what John writes in 1 John 5, verses 14 and 15. And this is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from him. Now, we know the Spirit of God works in our lives when we pray. We know that he is interceding for us, but he is also the one who, who moves us, who gives us the desires to pray for what it is that we ought to be praying for. And as we pray for what the Father actually wants to give us, what the Spirit of God is moving us to pray for, which will be according to the Word of God, we know that He will hear us and answer us. Now, the second reason we know that He's going to answer us is because we are asking Him in faith. You realize it requires faith. 
to be able to get anything from God, but it also requires faith to be able to pray in this particular way. Because why would we ever do what Jesus is calling us to do here unless we believe there's actually something uh, in it, something that we're going to receive? Why would we ask and seek and knock in this way if we thought we were simply running a fool's errand? You see, if we're going to do this, it's because we believe that God is actually going to answer our prayers and that he will give us what he promised. Jesus says in Matthew 21, verse 22, and all things you ask in prayer, believing you will receive. Again, think about uh, what, what he promised in our meditation. Whatever you ask, you know, whatever you ask and you don't doubt, it will be granted to you. Believe that you have received them and they will be given to you. And thirdly, we know that we will receive what we have asked because we have Jesus, really, his, um, well, his command to do this, but we also have his right. Uh, we will ask in the name of Jesus, on the basis of his command and in his name. Now, again, we should never look at anything that Jesus says anywhere in Scripture or what God says, for that matter, uh, isolated from what he says in other places. I mean, he's talking about prayer here, but it doesn't tell us everything that we need to know about prayer. And he is implying by these things are, you know, well, well, he's implying here that when we ask and seek and knock, that we will do it with the appropriate grounds on the appropriate basis. And the only ground that we have that we're going to be heard by God at all is because Jesus has earned it. So let's also remember what we read a little bit earlier in John chapter 16, verse 23. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, if you ask the Father for anything in my name, he will give it to you. Notice Jesus says, in my name. It has to be on the basis of what he has earned and what he has authorized. So we will pray and we will receive these things because, again, we will pray for what the Father wants us to pray for. As Jesus already taught us in the Lord's Prayer, we'll do it in faith because we believe that he's going to answer this prayer. And we know he will because Jesus has actually earned that right for us by the work that he has done. Now, we do need to understand that his promise is ironclad. And we will receive these things, but we do have to leave room for his timing and his will. Sometimes the Lord withholds for a little while what it is we have asked. Maybe it's not the best time for us to receive what it is that we have asked. Maybe we have yet to learn patience and waiting upon the Lord. Maybe he's intending to strengthen our faith. Maybe there's a particular sin we're involved in and we need to repent before the Lord is going to give to us what we've asked. But we do know this, that when we pray, the Lord hears. And as John told us a little bit earlier in 1 John, we know that we have already received what it is we have asked. And we know that if we look for it long enough, we will finally see that we, we actually do. Now, finally, uh, let's look at the encouragement that Jesus gives us. Again, another argument from the lesser to the greater. And that is, if we are willing to do this for our children, if we're willing to give them what they ask, how much more will our Heavenly Father give us what we ask? Jesus says in verses 9 through 11, Or what man is there among you who, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone. Or if he asks for a fish, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? Now, let's think about this for a moment. Uh, this, I think, particularly comes home to those of us who are parents, and we know how important it is to take care of our children. And I think particularly when they're young and they're helpless. I mean, how do we respond to their particular needs when they come and they ask? If they're hungry and they ask us for food, uh, we give them the food that they need. And we don't give them things that aren't gonna be helpful to them. We're not gonna give them rocks 
uh, for, for bread. Uh, we're also going to give them things that are healthy, a fish and not a snake, a poisonous viper. We're not going to give them poison to eat. Now, Jesus' point is simply this. If that's what we would do, and notice he says being evil, if we're evil by nature and we will do this, how much more will, will, our, will our Heavenly Father uh, give what is good? Now, Jesus was speaking to his disciples who were converted, and even they had a lot of residual evil in their lives, but he was also talking to a bunch of Jews who were unconverted, and each of them could say in their hearts, I think particularly even at that time, that they would do what is necessary for their children. But again, we have an evil nature, and we would do that. What about our Heavenly Father? What would he do for us? Because he's not evil. He's perfect, and he's holy. He loves with infinite love. And he's one who speaks the truth and actually carries through everything that he has promised. How much more will he do for his children what we would do for ours? Well, the answer is infinitely more than we would. He is disposed to do exactly what he said he would do. And so Jesus is encouraging us to ask the Father, to ask him for the things we need. First of all, to give us a humble and merciful heart that is willing to love. Even the most flawed, even the most imperfect, even the greatest sinners, even those who have injured us personally, that we might reach out to them in mercy and help them in their need, uh, particularly their need of salvation. But let's also be encouraged to ask, and Jesus is encouraging us also to ask for other needs as well for everything that we might possibly need, for the needs of our brothers and sisters in the Lord, for the needs of those who are unconverted, and of course their greatest need, which is the Lord Jesus. And let's especially be encouraged by this to ask that the Lord would bless his kingdom, which is what Jesus is teaching us to pray in the, in the Lord's Prayer, that he would bless his kingdom and cause it to move forward in a way that only he can, which is by the outpouring of of the Holy Spirit. Essentially, let's ask for revival, that the Lord would empower his people, empower us, and that he would awaken the dead through the preaching of the gospel. So let's ask. Let's ask for these things. Let's keep on asking for these things until we see the answer to these prayers. Let's seek the Lord's face and keep on seeking that face of blessing until it is revealed to us, to the church as a whole, and to the world. In other words, let's keep seeking the Lord until he brings revival and let's keep knocking on the door of heaven until the door opens. Let's not give God a moment's rest until he opens the doors of heaven and pours out a blessing so great that the world cannot contain it. And let me just add this in closing. Let's believe what we've been told in Scripture already in 1 John that we have received what it is we've asked even if we don't see these things right away. You know, there were those in the history of the church that actually practiced these things, and I'm thinking of one example, and that is uh, uh, Jonathan Edwards and those that uh, prayed during his day for revival. Okay? They, they saw the Great Awakening. They thought that perhaps the, what they call the latter-day glory, this is, again, a post-millennial view that God was going to bring his kingdom with great power, they were going to see uh, the kingdom move forward in ways they had never seen before. And so they, as they saw this revival, they made a covenant together to pray. And they prayed. They prayed for the rest of their lives, and they did not see another revival. And yet, they still knew the Lord had heard their prayers. They knew that he had already answered their prayers. And you know what? Those prayers were actually answered because in the next century, it began perhaps the greatest missionary movement that the church has ever seen. So even when you don't see the answers to your prayers, that doesn't mean that you haven't, you know, that you haven't received it. It just means that the Lord's answer is yet a little ways off. He is answering or will answer those prayers. So we should never begin to think that because we don't see the answer that it's not going to happen. We need to leave room for God's perfect plan that will be worked out in his perfect time. We need to believe that what Jesus says here is true, 
The one who asks receives. Everyone who asks receives. Everyone who seeks finds. Everyone who knocks, it will be open, and we need to move forward. As Joseph Hall once wrote, uh, this quote, good prayers never come weeping home. I am sure I shall receive either what I ask or what I should ask. And that's, that's another point, isn't it? Sometimes the Lord won't give us what we're asking for because He intends to give us something better, the thing we should, should really be asking for. And John Trapp writes this, God never denied that soul anything that went as far as heaven to ask it. God will fulfill His promises. We can believe it. We should believe it and act upon it. Well, let's uh, bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And let's ask the Lord to help us uh, to do this.